Welcome to Global Community Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. I want you to make it a special encounter this morning between you and your Savior. God has already given us his word and God says, no matter what come your way, I will be there. Psalms 80, the psalmist says, Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. O oh God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. O oh Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them to drink tears in large measure. You make us an object of contention to our neighbors. And our enemies laugh among themselves. O God of hosts, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. You removed the vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground before it and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow, and the cedars of God with its bowl. It was sending out its branches to the sea and its shoot to the river. Why have you broken down its hedges so that all who pass by pick its fruit? A boar from the forest eats it away, and whatever moves in the field feeds upon it. O God of hosts, turn now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine, even the shoot which your right hand has planted and on the son whom your, you have strengthened for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Psalm 80, Father, speak to us for your word. Your word is truth. Cause your face to truly shine upon your people. And Lord, bring about that restoration. Bring about that revival. Bring about that awakening. So that once again, your people would be turned completely to you. Revive us. Restore us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Someone says, as measured by almost any standard, the church in America today is in a period of decline. Every year, more than 4,000 churches close their doors, while only... 100 new ones are planted. We are told that in the decade 1990 to 2000, it was calculated that 38,000 fewer churches were planted than that would need to be planted just to keep up with the growth in population. So which means that we are on a serious decline, not 
And the sad thing is not just in numbers, but the sad thing is in terms of morality, in terms of our purity, in terms of our really adhering to the things of God. There is one new story that I read. It said a Methodist church in Iowa last December displayed a nativity scene with two women serving as the parents of Jesus. Another major denomination changed change their constitution regarding the ordination of ministers by removing all language about marriage between a man and a woman and any reference to repentance and sin. In a day when the world is getting darker and darker, there is a need for the people of God to be salt and light, to shine brighter and brighter in the midst of this dark world. My friend, there is no greater need for the church than a return to God. I don't think we primarily need nicer buildings. I don't think we primarily need better infrastructure. I think more than anything, we need to return to God. When God is not the center of our lives, when God is not the preeminence in the church, then things like what I mentioned a while ago will happen. When we get to the point where we begin to compromise instead of standing on the solid word of God, we begin to water it down and we begin to let the culture dictate the direction of the church. Darkness is setting in all around us. It was this darkness that was setting in around Israel. When the Assyrians came in, and because of their disobedience, the Assyrians, God allowed the Assyrians to come in and take their land. And God turned away from them because they first turned away from God. And now they are crying out to God, and they are asking him to restore, to restore, and to revive. As we've looked through this last couple of weeks, we've seen the, the, the cry for revival. That is the Psalm 80, is a lament. It's the prayer of a people that were distressed by God's discipline. It is the petitions of a people defeated by the enemy. It is the plea of a people desperate for God's help, and they are crying Lord, we know that we have turned away from you, but Lord, we see, we can, we can feel the consequences of turning away from you. And Lord, we are asking you to shine on us. We are asking you once again to restore us, O oh God. Make your face to shine on us so that we may be saved. They chose to turn away from God and now in their misery, they are crying out to God. The good thing is that scripture tells us that when we turn away from God and when we come back with an earnest heart and we plea and we ask him, we ask him to, to return to us. We ask him to forgive our sins. We ask him to restore us. God is a God of restoration and he restores us. Verse 18, then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. We mentioned the concept of revival, that restoration that they are asking for. They are asking God to, to, to quicken us, to give us life again. Cause our hearts to be warmed toward you once again. Cause us, O oh God, to feel your power and your presence. Cause us to know, Lord, that you have our backs. Restore us. 
So the restoration or the revival is first of all a return to a life of total obedience to God. And it's not just that we peek here, peek and choose here and there what we go in to obey. It is a life of total dependence on God. It is a life of total obedience. And we say, yes, Lord, I am going to follow you. It may not always be easy to follow you, but it is always the best thing to live a life in obedience to God. It involves all the acknowledgement and confession of our sins where we take responsibility for sin. It involves repentance from sin, a turning away from sin. And in our day, we do not hear that word repent used too often. But when Jesus came, he was saying, repent. When John the Baptist came, he was saying, repent. When all the apostles, when, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and proclaimed the message, the message was basically, repent, turn from your sins. You see, back then, the word repentance was not even basically a religious word. It was, of course, in those days, the people were nomadic. They moved from place to place. And as they moved from place to place, of course, they did not have street signs and they, they did not have maps and they did not have, they did not have GPS like we did. And so in the middle of the desert, it would be very easy for somebody to get lost. You see, everything seems familiar. You see sand, you see trees. And in the mid immediate, you realize that you are, the place around you is not familiar and you are lost. And the first act of repentance is to realize you are going the wrong direction. Instead of moving toward God, we are moving away from God. So we realize that we are going in the wrong direction. And secondly, the second act of repentance is we completely turn around and move in the opposite direction. Away from God, now you are moving toward God. So they are saying, Lord, revive us. So it's a total dependence upon obedience to God. It's a renewal of our passion for God is what revival is, is what restoration is. Our passion for God, where seeking after God becomes my top priority. Revival is the restoration of the favor of God upon our lives. God of the armies or Lord of hosts, restore us and make your face shine upon us and we will be saved. The restoration of God's presence, the restoration of the favor of God's power Without those two, all we have is a church that is dry and empty. The presence and the power of God is critical in the life of the church. God does not just want us existing. God does not just want church to be something that we come and we fulfill our, we, we fulfill our conditions for the week. You know, it becomes a cultural thing. No, Church has to be where the people of God come. They desire the power of God and they desire the presence of God. And only the power and the presence of God can truly make a lasting difference in people's lives. So the cry for restoration. Secondly, the concept of restoration. Thirdly, the conditions. If we are going to be restored, it's just going to be revival. God requires certain things of us. And I want to mention three of those. Number one, for there to be restoration, the first condition, a posture of humility before God. A posture of humility before God. You remember the, 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 the verse, famous verse, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. The first thing that God says is that humility. If my people will come in humility... The idea of humility, of the word humility is to, under, to be under another. When we humble ourselves before God, we are acknowledging his lordship and his headship over 
our lives. We are admitting to him that we are weak. We are saying to him, Lord, I am weak, but you are strong. Lord, without you, I am nothing. I am nothing. We need him. We need God. And so we humble ourselves. We submit to him. We surrender to him. We humble ourselves before God, allowing him to mold and to shape our lives. So the first condition is humility. Doesn't Peter tell us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, here's what Peter says. He says this to you. He says this to me. He says this to the church as a whole. Humble yourselves, be therefore, under God's mighty hands, that he may lift you up in due time. And Peter says, casting all our cares, all our anxieties upon him, because he cares for us. God cares about you. God cares about you. Even sometimes when you don't feel like he cares for you, he cares for you. And the road back to restoration is, first of all, our humility realizing that we really, really need God. The picture of humility that comes to my mind is John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of Jesus he was gathering disciples. And then Jesus appeared on the scene and immediately John's attention turned away from himself and he turned to Jesus. And he says, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And John says, I must decrease, but he must increase. I am nothing, but God is all. And I turn to depend upon him. So firstly, a posture of humility before God. Secondly, I come to a position of hungering for God. Hungering for God. Let me ask you, have you ever been hungry? I mean, really hungry. And it's like your, all your strength is gone. All your vitality is gone until you finally get to that place when you put something in your mouth. But that's something that Scripture is talking about is not hungering for food, but it's a hungering for God. Where nothing else will satisfy but the presence of God in your life. A hungering for God. What we are talking about, what we are talking about is a seeking God's face. Seeking God's face. That seek, that word seek here is to desire something badly. We come to the place where God is the number one priority, the greatest desire of our hearts. We come to that point where nothing is life. We realize that nothing in life is as important and as precious and as needful than God. And we want all of God and all what God has to give. A hunger after God, a deep-seated yearning, a deep seated desire for God. One of the great Roman emperors, a guy named Marcus Aurelius Antonius, he said these words, he said, the true worth of a man is to be measured by the objects that he pursues. The true worth of a man is measured by the objects that he pursues. The things that he spends his life going after. His energy is going after. I ask you, what is the desire of your heart? What is the chief thing that you spend all your time and your energy going after? I'm saying to us, the people of God, our greatest desire should be for God. Jesus says in Matthew, blessed are they who do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So true restoration comes when there is a humility before God, a hungering for God. Number three, a panting for the holiness of God. A panting for the holiness of God. And this is another word that we don't hear too much these days. Holiness. 
If the scripture, even though the scripture says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Even though the scripture says that we are the people of God, we are saints. That word literal, that word saints literally means the holy ones of God. And for, so for God to truly set our souls on fire, there must be a panting for the holiness of God. Let me paint you a picture of what that looks like. The Apostle Paul paints that picture in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Here's the words. Here are the words of somebody that wanted God more than they wanted anything else. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. What was Paul saying? He's saying nothing else is as important to me than knowing God than having that desire to seek after God than pleasing God than walking with God. My chiefest desire, my main desire, my greatest pursuit is for the holiness of God, a life which conforms forms to God. David, we remember him, King David, and it's sad that the one thing that we remember when we think of David, the thing that comes to our mind the quickest is that David and Goliath, that he had an affair with Goliath, and that's true. But you understand that even David, when he fell, his heart's desire was for God. He cried out to God. And God says to David, even though he could have regarded himself as the chief of sinners, as the apostle Paul himself regarded himself as the chief of sinners, but God said about David, I have found David to be a man after my own heart. Here is what David writes, Psalms 27 verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after him, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. One thing I want is God. One thing I want is to be around him. One thing I want is to sense his power and his presence in my life. I understand that I am a sinner. I understand that I leave God out of my life. Sin will wreck my life. But when I come back to God and I ask him to cleanse me and I ask him to wash me and I ask him to restore me and I ask him to give me that desire for holiness, God will restore my friend. God is a God of a second and a third and a fourth chance. God, thank God, God does not treat us like human beings treats us. And in the next verse, Psalm 42 and verse 1, here is a cry of a man who really desired holiness. Psalm 42 verse 1, David says, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul first for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? He could not wait to be in the presence of God. He could not wait to be having fellowship with God. A hungering for God. A panting after the holiness of God. That is, my friend, true revival. I remember when I was growing up, we would have what we call revival services. You remember those crusades, you know, an evangelist would come from um, out of town, probably out of the country, and he would put out all these signs and invite people to come to church, and the evangelist would preach, and he would give invitations, and people would walk down the aisle and this kind of stuff. Sometimes, yes, the people were genuinely saved, but often, you know, it happened to be it's just an emotional thing. People would respond emotionally. But what's not I'm talking about? I'm talking about deep-seated revival where the power and the presence of God really comes and people's lives are truly transformed. Somebody says this about revival. He says, by revival, we are not referring to the popular image of setting up a tent and putting a sign out in the front of the church. 
He says, genuine revival begins when through the preaching of the word of God, the Holy Spirit convicts people of their spiritual apathy and sin. He opens up their eyes to a new glimpse of the holiness of God and God's wrath against sin. That is true revival. We read Nehemiah chapter 8. You see what happened? The people of God were hungry for the word of God. Nehemiah opened up the word of God I mean, in, in, at the water gate, and all the people stood up, and they gave reverence to God. And immediately, because they had not heard the word of God for such a long time, they were not living according to the will of God. But when the word of God were proclaimed, they were broken before the word of God, and a revival took place at the water gate. If there's going to be revival among us, if there's going to be revival in the life of the church, the word of God empowered by the spirit of God has to play a prominent role as we pray and we cry out to God. So the conditions of revival. Let me give you Roman numeral 4. What time is quickly slipping away. Roman numeral 4. The consequences of revival. The results. What happens when true revival takes place. Verse 18, then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. It says, God, when you restore our lives, when you bring about this mighty change, we will not turn back, but we will call upon you. We'll begin to cry out to you. The results of revival, let me give you a couple of those. Number one, God will once again hear his people. God will once again hear his people. Do you see how many times he says they've been crying out to God and instead of God answering their prayers, God has been feeding them tears for food. They are crying out and they're saying, Lord, why are you angry with our prayer? God, why are you not hearing us? And he said, Lord, restore us and we will be saved. Restore us and life will get back to normal for us. And so when there is revival, God will once again hear his people. It will not be an instance where you are praying to God and your prayer seems like it's hitting the ceiling and coming back. It's not getting any further. God will hear. You see, God will forgive our sins. Once the sins are forgiven, then the prayer lines will be opened once again. Once the prayer lines are open, the line to fellowship with God is opened once again. And we'll be able to come into his presence and worship him and sense his power and sense his peace and sense his joy. David, when he had turned away from God, he cried out and he said, Lord, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. When there is revival, God again hears his people. Secondly, God will once again help his people. God will once again help. They are crying out for help because they are there. The Assyrians have taken them captive, the, 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 those of the ten tribes. And later down in, in 586, the, the, um, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and take Judah captive. And the writer there is seeing what has happened and he's seeing what is coming. And he's saying the only hope for us is for us to cry out to God, Lord, restore us. And when God restores us, God will once again help his people. Go back to the blessing that we started with. God says to Aaron, bless the people, say in these words, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. In other words, when God's presence, when God blesses you, when God's face is shining upon you, you are once again experiencing the favor of God. God is once again pleased with us, and he says that God will help us. Doesn't scripture tell us that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of need? 
tell you, when our lives are straightened up, when we are seeking after God, Scripture tells us that God will help us. Because you know what puts that, what, what is it that disturbs that fellowship? What is it that prevents God's blessing in our lives is what Isaiah this talks about in Isaiah chapter 59. He says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ears dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have, separ have placed a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you when we turn back to God and we begin to seek after him God will once again hear his people God will once again help his people here is a promise in Psalm 84 and verse 11 take this to the bank for the Lord God is a son and a shield the Lord will give grace and glory. And he says, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That's a promise from God. Thirdly, oh God will let before that. God will restore strength. God will restore his strength. Look at where the verse says, uh, when we turn back to God, God gives us strength again. Your strength is depleted. God can restore your strength. Here's what he says. Isaiah says to the people, God, he, God, gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But he said, but those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not become faint. God will restore strength. So they cry out, Lord, shine on us. When God helps us, God not only will restore strength, but God's face will again shine God's face will again, in other words, the blessing of God will once again be upon your life. Look at verse 17. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we will turn back from you, revive us, and we will call upon your name. Now, look back at this verse a minute. Verse 17 a key verse in the psalm. He says, once you turn back to us, once restoration happens, he says, let your right hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. The man of your right hand has a double reference. Of course, he's talking about Israel as God's people. But that is a messianic psalm that goes all the way to a reference of the Lord Jesus Christ, the man of God's right hand, the son of man. Basically, ultimately, restoration comes to Israel when God sends them the Messiah and when God finally will restore the kingdom to Israel. God will restore. Here is what Ezekiel says about that day. Ezekiel says, Ezekiel chapter 39. When I have brought them back from the nations and have gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will prove holy through them in the sight of many nations. Then, then, they will know that I am the Lord their God. Look at this. For though I sent them into exile among the nations, I will gather them to their own land, not leaving any behind. I will no longer, look at this precious promise, I will no longer hide my face from them. For I will pour out my spirit on the people of Israel, declares the Lord. God saying, you are where you are now. Because of disobedience. You are where you are now because of your rebellion. But God says when restoration comes, 
God says, I will restore Israel because God has made an everlasting covenant with them. And for us, the people of God, God has given us that precious promise that one day we will reign with him forever and ever. And God says, we see, when you turn away from me, when you allow sin to hamper your relationship with me, God says, my hands are extended toward you. And God is saying, come, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Jeremiah chapter 33, 15 and 16. Here's what it says. Talking about the restoration. In those days, and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. Look at this glorious promise. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord or War Righteousness. So the precious promise is this. God says, I love you so much. God says to you, I love you so much. I really don't want you to stray from me. When you stray from me, all you do is bring misery upon your life. Let me tell you something. The things of this world, the pleasures of this life may seem to be alluring, may seem to be attractive, may seem to offer a lot. But my friend, as a child of God, what really satisfies us is a genuine, intimate relationship with God. And when you don't have that, it's like you have nothing. And Israel was there, and they were suffering, and they said to God, Lord, restore us, and we'll be saved. May your prayer today be, wherever you are, may this be your prayer. Lord, restore me, and I will be saved. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your precious word thank you for your precious promise to restore Lord I know that more than anything else what we need is a revival what we need is a fresh touch of God in our lives and in the life of the church bring revival bring restoration Bring a new awakening, O oh God, that your name will be glorified, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you for walking with us through Psalm 80. And I pray that God will bless you. Uh, may you take the time in your own personal time, continue to read it. Continue to study it. Indeed, marvelous, marvelous Sam. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.